children, we completed part one of the text where we discussed about the education system that was prevalent in ancient India. We spoke in detail about Gurukulas, Ashramas, etc. Now in part two of the text, we shall be looking into how the system prevailed during the time of Buddha and later periods. Many monasteries and viharas came into being. This was mostly for monks and nuns who gained and honed their skills and knowledge through discussion and debates with learned men. Centers for higher education developed around the viharas and students from across the world came here. Looking into the accounts rendered by Huan Sang, Ai Jing, Jataka Tales and others, we get to know that the rulers and the society in general gave a lot of importance to education. This resulted in many educational centers coming up. The most famous universities during the ancient times were situated in Takshashila, Nalanda, Vallabhi, Vikramashila, Odantapuri and Jagaddala. While these universities developed in connection with Viharas, the ones situated in Banaras, Navdeep and Kanchi were attached to temples which enriched the community life. It is important to note that these centers of learning catered to the needs of students who took to advanced levels of learning. Debates and discussions with renowned scholars was the most prominent and effective way of improving one's knowledge. You may have noticed in Indian historical movies various scholars being summoned by a king to the court where they would debate and exchange their views and ideas. Well, this was practiced for a very long time. In fact, this is akin to the modern day workshops, seminars and conferences. Have you heard of Takshashila and Nalanda? Well, of course you are right. These were the most ancient universities that existed in India. Currently in ruins, these have been declared as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. Takshashila This noted center of learning taught Buddhist ideologies for several centuries. Many students the world over came here to study. The curriculum comprised of ancient scriptures, law, medicine, astronomy, military science and the 18 shilpas or arts. Teachers' expertise was what made this university special. Have you heard of Panini? Panini, the Indian grammarian who was an expert in language and grammar, and who also authored Ashtadhyayi was one of the pupils of Takshashila. One of the most renowned physicians, Jivaka, and Chanakya, who is an exponent of statecraft, were students here. In spite of the long, tedious journey, many students from Kashi, Kosala, Magadha, and other countries came here. An important aspect to be noted is the freedom that was given to teachers which ranged from selecting their students to framing the syllabi. The course ended only when the teacher was satisfied with the student's performance. Well, it is interesting to note that a student studied a subject of his choice but was made an expert by the time he left. Next. We shall look into Nalanda University which was a prominent centre of learning from 5th century CE to 12th century CE. Many Chinese scholars like Huan Sang and Ai Jing visited this place in the 7th century CE. They have noted in their accounts about how nearly 100 discourses took place in a day on a daily basis in a variety of disciplines which covered a wide range of subjects available to them. Huan Sang also enrolled himself here to study the Yoga Shastras. Back then, knowledge which was considered sacred was passed on without a fee. Whoever contributed towards education were highly respected and it was the highest form of donation. 
rich parents, wealthy merchants and the society contributed financially by gifting lands and buildings. You may have heard of Agraharas in South India. These were centers of teaching and learning. This was basically a whole settlement of learned Brahmins with its own government and which was maintained by generous donations. I quote from the text, Temples, Matas, Jain Basadis and Buddhist Viharas also existed as other sources of learning during this period. Unquote. Though education continued in ashramas, temples and local schools, the medieval period was a witness to the emergence of maktabas and madrasas. Indigenous education flourished during the pre-colonial times. Many documents state that villagers also wholeheartedly supported this endeavour in the south of India. On the whole, it is very essential to note that the ancient education system focused on the holistic development of a student. The rich cultural traditions were indispensable for the intellectual, physical, moral and artistic development of a child. I quote from the text. Our present day education system has a lot to learn from the ancient education system of India. Therefore, the stress is being laid on connecting learning to the world outside the school. Today, educationists recognize the role and importance of multilingual and multicultural education, thereby connecting the ancient and the traditional knowledge with contemporary learning. Unquote. Let us do a quick comprehension check, which I believe you will be able to complete by discussing it with your peers. Question number one. Where did nuns and monks receive their education? Question number two. What is Panini known for? Question number three. Which university did Huen Sang and Ai Jing study at? Question number four. Which subject did Huen Sang study in India? Question number five. How did society help in the education of the students? So children, I hope you have understood this very important topic. Before I leave, I have something for you. You should know that the largest numbers that the Greeks and Romans used were 106, whereas Hindus used numbers as large as 10 to the power of 53 with specific names as early as 5000 BCE in the Vedic period. Wow, right? So until we meet next, have a great day.